and we're good to go. So welcome everybody to the Jewelry Sales Academy. This is our first webinar session of which we are calling Across the Case, where we, our goal at the Jewelry Sales Academy is really to try and give you a great uh, insight and access to people in the industry who are movers, shakers, who have done great things. And I couldn't say anything better than the person that we have today as the inaugural guest of Peter Smith. Uh, Peter has been along the industry for over 40 years of experience. He was president of Hearts on Fire Memoir. He works with uh, multiple different companies, a plethora of companies all across the nation. He's written books on hiring, hiring squirrels. He writes articles that are shared with us constantly. And just to be able to share kind of the same, uh, same, I guess, a digital space with you, Peter, is, uh, is you know, it's great to have you on here. So is there anything I missed or anything you'd like to add before we get started? No, no, I think uh, I, I, just to clarify, I don't want people hiring squirrels. I, I actually want them hiring people, but that's... I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to confuse you. Know, why would I want to hire squirrels? Come on, that's... But no, thank you for the for the, the welcome introduction. And it's really, really great to be with you guys. And um, uh, thank you for the invitation to be the first uh, uh, guest on your uh, your very first uh, webinar. So good to just very good to be here from 65 degree Boston, sunny in 65. So I don't know what's happening in the rest of the country, but it's pure heaven here. It's very, very hot. So, I mean, we're going to get directly onto it. I see we've got over, I think we've got 20 something stores on right now. So I know you can't see the list, but we've got stores from all across the nation. I know a lot of them, I'm seeing Texas, South Arkansas, all these other ones. And so it's very, very hot here. And so central time, this is a lot of people's morning meetings. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. You and I kind of had a pre-conversation of this and I thought it was just, it was unbelievable some of the things that you said, but, you know, kind of the market has been just crazy over the last few years. We went through a spot where we thought, you know, it was the end of the world to, okay, it's not so bad to all of a sudden, jewelry is just astronomically growing. And, you know, we talked about the other day, you sit on the news, you hear it pre-JCK, all these different things is where, although nothing's happening, I guess people are starting to feel mentally like something might happen. What as retailers do you think that we should be focusing on or working on going into the holiday season to either continue to grow, maintain, or just kind of your opinion on the market? Yeah. Uh, so I think it is um, it is an odd time to say the least, because it feels a little bit to me, and, and uh, I'm in you know, contact with enough retailers and enough folks on the supplier side to sense almost a burgeoning what's next, what's going to happen here? Is the is the bottom going to fall out of this thing? And so I, I th there's nothing to support the idea that we ought to be worried. In fact, if anything, I think that the the bigger issue is more uh, more that we're we're, it, we're if we continue to act like something is going to happen, it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and and it ends up uh, happening within our own environments. But let's give a little context, because I think th th it's probably time for a little bit of a reality check, to, a check on how things are. So if you look at the, the broader economy right now, you have, I am, let me start here. I'm 100% certain that there's a recession coming. I'm also 100% certain that it may not happen this year. It may not happen next year. It may not even happen the year before. It's cyclical, so there will always be a recession, but there is no evidence to support the idea that it's going to happen this year. So let's look at some of the some of the the, the, the data. Despite rising interest rates, housing prices have surprisingly maintained their value. Right, so the bottom didn't drop out of the housing market. We're almost at full employment, so much so that it's creating its own set of issues, right? But we're literally as close to full employment as we've likely ever been in recent decades. Wages are starting to go up. Energy prices are coming down. And if you look at inflation, which we've heard lots and lots of inflation talk in recent months, this time last year, inflation was at a high of 6.2%. The most recent report on inflation is 2.97%. Now, just the standard sort of number is usually around three to three and a half, but inflation is actually at 2.97%, way, way below what it was last year, 6.2. So that's very, very healthy. You look at the first six months of the NASDAQ, it is the best growth in 40 years, right? So the first six months through June of the NASDAQ, the best in 40 years. 
Our GDP as a country is second in the world to Saudi Arabia. So literally the only country in the world that has a better GDP than the US right now is Saudi Arabia. Now you come a little closer to home and you look at physical retail. And for the first time since 2016, we had infinitely more physical retail stores open this year than, we, than we've had in, again, since, since 2016. We basically had about 5,100 retail stores, brick and mortar retail stores open this year, or last year, excuse me, last year, the full year, compared to about 2,600 closed. So we literally had almost twice as many stores opened as closed. And then the last sort of thing I'll point out on the sort of macro stuff is that, and I think you and I were talking about it a couple of days ago, William, this idea that we read somewhere recently that a store had closed and two of the things they pointed to for closing was the online situation and COVID. Now, clearly COVID has been a remarkable, the COVID economy, which is distinct from the COVID virus, but the COVID economy for our industry has been remarkable. And the online business itself, last year it was 14.6%. The year before it was 14.6%. Now we know that you can't sort of take stock in that and say, therefore I don't need to participate. Therefore I don't need to have a great digital presence. Therefore I don't need to have e-commerce capability because we know somewhere in around 80%, certainly of the luxury journey starts online, right? And it'll ultimately end up being consummated in the retail stores, in physical stores. But this idea somehow that we're losing massive amount of business to online and or COVID is just simply not true. So now let's come a little closer and look at our business, right? You, you sort of referred, you know, in your opening remarks, to, to, to going from a situation sort of in around February, March, April of 2020, where we're all thinking what's going on, the, the whole world is coming to an end. Well, let's go back just a, 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 a couple of months prior to that. In 2019, as an industry, we did $62 billion in the US. Our jewelry industry in the US in 2019 was, was a historical high. We'd never reached these numbers before with $62 billion. Clearly in the next year, there were interruptions and significant interruptions depending on what state you were in. But we finished awfully close to that again, despite the fact that some businesses were very significantly impacted, all businesses were impacted, but some of them were very, very impacted. And then we had to obviously be very, very flexible and do some things that had never been done before. But really by the late summer, early fall, of 2020, the year that COVID hit, we began to realize something quite magical is happening here, right? Something really magical is starting to happen here. And it did happen. And the following year in 2021, we did $86 billion as an industry. So we went from, from 2019's 62 billion through the COVID year, and the following year went to eight, almost 40% higher than the highest number ever recorded you know, in our industry. Now I've seen 2022 reports showing somewhere around $90 billion. I don't know that that's true. I'm finding it hard to believe. I suspect we'll see some uh, uh, editing of that number, but I would imagine it's still gonna be right around that 86 plus billion dollar mark, which is absolutely incredible. So that's the context here. Now, look at the independent retail performance this year. We, as, as a group of independent jewelers, and that's my conversation here, I know that there was some interesting uh, news from, from, from Signet that came out recently, showed them sort of off, I think around 14% or so on a comp basis. But if you look at the independent performance for this year, year to date, they're down 3.5%, right? So here we have this year where we're starting to envision, you know, the heavens collapsing in upon us. And we are at three and a half percent, you know, compared to years that were just history beyond our wildest imaginations. And in fact, I saw yesterday, Edge Retail Academy's uh, numbers came out 
uh, for for July versus the previous July, and independent retailers are down two and a half percent. Or another way of looking at that is you're within two and a half percent of history. So even if we give back a little business in the in the remaining four months, right, August through the end of the year, and there's no indicators, by the way, no significant indicators that that's going to happen. But even if we give a little bit back, we're on pace to actually deliver a remarkable year yet again. Now, I noticed that the beers, you know, reports come out this week talking about that they're way off and so on and so forth. But if you actually read their language, even in their reports, what they've said is, you know, our business is down. However, collections and bridal have been very strong performers, but they pointed to continuing COVID situations in China as being a big part of their issues. So broadly speaking, I think the macro environment and the contextual environment of what's going on in retail doesn't support any negative attitude at all. However, <laughs> here's the part that worries me a little bit. And as, as an observer, now both uh, on the supplier side and also on the retailer side, that if we have the independence, which is the case down sort of three and a half percent, I'm seeing suppliers who were down 30, 40, and 50 percent. And that suggests to me, that's a massive gap, right? You can talk about what's reasonable from a trailing standpoint, what should the delta be, but when you've got retailers performing within 5% of historical years, really three, the last three years, and you have vendors you know, trailing you know, by 30, 40, and even 50%, that suggests to me that enough retailers are standing with shovels waiting to dig holes. Exactly. I mean, that was the most, that was the thing I enjoyed talking most about is that, I mean, we talked that jewelry is experience-based. And the overall feel that you represent in your store really represents the numbers that you're going to do. And I, that was the biggest point that I really took away from the day is that most people, although there is no downturn, are already trying to participate in a downturn. Well, I think we all know it, and it's no great sort of um, um, light bulb moment to suggest that it can so fast become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you believe things are going to be bad, then in fact you will make it so because it impacts the things that you do on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis. Now, look, here's one of the things that perhaps we should be hearing more about and talking more about. And that is the idea that between us, we've had, especially Jim and I here, the two old geezers on this call, that, that for years and years and years, we've talked about your competitors are not other jewelers. And, and it's, it's almost seemed a little bit like, you know, just sort of a mantra that we're trying to convince ourselves of. If you don't realize now, having gone through what we've gone through over the last three years, that your competitor is not, in fact, the other jeweler in town or in your state or wherever. Your competitor is every place that absorbs discretionary money. If you don't understand that, then you were sleeping over the last three years. So I'm of the opinion that the, it's not the if you're concerned about the macro issues versus the micro issues, the issues that are impacted on a daily basis in your store. And I'll talk about replenishing as being one of those. I've actually heard of enough retailers now who are already beginning to slow your replenishing down. I don't know how that works. I don't know how you take the products that sell well day in and day out and decide that somehow we're better off not having them. I've heard of enough retailers, even with my own situation, retailers who've said, look, we're going to look at you next year. We're going to bring you in next year to do your sales masterclass. And I'm like, what's happening this year? What is your plan this year for training? I've heard of people cutting their marketing budgets, you know, the, and then not addressing the people situation the way they ought to be addressing this, the, the, the people situation. If I had to point to one thing that's going to determine the success or lack thereof of business in the remaining sort of, you know, close to four months. I'm going to say it's mindset. It's as simple as that because none of the macro conditions and certainly not the industry conditions would suggest 
that you should be preparing for anything resembling an Armageddon. The conditions are all very, very positive. And I think that, 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 that retail owners ought to be uh, embracing the positive and they ought to be sharing it with their teams and they ought to be establishing for their teams an expectation that we are going to have a very good year. We're going to have a very good fourth quarter. Obviously, we're in August now and the back to school and all that goes along with that. But we were last year, by the way, at this point. Um, but but the easiest way to sort of begin to unravel is to is to believe somehow that things are going to go, you know, sideways and start pulling on that thread. And before you know it, it's you've created a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'd like to add, I mean, before we go into this next point, I mean, so many retailers take on that recession mentality and it really gets into where you almost are your price competing on diamonds. It's almost like you're selling a single skew product versus an experience. And we always like to say, hey, if you're selling a three or four carat diamond, what you're really competing against is a Corvette or a trip to the Bahamas or something like that. And a Corvette will do zero to 60 in like three seconds. So you better have a good presentation and give somebody a really good feeling of being able to come in and really love what they're buying to keep selling it to them. But talking about that on selling different items and how that's impacted different stores, this brings me into one of the biggest requested questions we had for you is over lab-grown diamonds. And we have, you and I had a really great conversation about this the other day. And one of the things that we've seen a lot from members in the group and questions is that their lab-grown diamonds when they first started was a very small portion of their sales of bridal sales, and now it's growing more and more. And they're kind of wanting to know, what's your opinion on that? And what do you think that our bridal presentations should start transitioning to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a huge topic, right? And it, and it's 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 one of the most uh, discussed topics in our industry right now. Um, I, 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 I sort of marvel, I think, at the number of folks who are celebrating the pricing madness right now as though somehow they were predicting all of this. And I suspect that an awful lot of them are the very same people who sell their stocks after the market has crashed, right? So I, I, I think that here's what, here's what we know. We know that the technology is out of the box and it's not going back, right? So anybody who believes somehow that this is going to go away, I want to talk to you about your, 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 as an industry, how we viewed online. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 2002, three, four, when there was just absolute mayhem about the emergence of online business in our industry. And we somehow thought we were the industry that was going to stop it, right? So the technology is not going back in the box. Customers are buying lab grown. So on many respects, customers are voting with their money and they're buying it. So I, I, I think there's a danger in talking about lab grown as a moral issue, because you can't win in that regard. But we ought to be thinking about it as a business issue. And if you've made the decision to, 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 to bring lab grown into your business, what I think you're, it, 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 you've got to do is to tell your team why you brought it in and what you expect, right? Because it can, it can by, by sort of default, if you will, Having it in your store and enabling salespeople, if they're inclined to do so, to go to the lowest common denominator in terms of price is a very, very dangerous place to be, right? It's a very, very dangerous place to be. So I think that having that conversation, say, look, we're bringing it in. Here's how it's going to be in our store. We're going to build a narrative on that. That narrative, if the customer asks for lab grown, is going to include a requirement that you also tell the natural diamond story. So you can't have in an iso in isolation a lab-grown story, even if it's brought up by the customer. You must tell your diamond story, which which ought to include both. Obviously, if customer comes in looking for natural and they're, they're not asking for lab-grown, you might rethink you know that that situation. But I, it in many respects, if you if you look at what's happened. In the last two decades in our industry, we have seen a decline in foot traffic into stores, right? And it wasn't so much abated in the midst of the COVID economy. We just happened to have far less people coming in and we were closing a disproportionate amount of them because they weren't coming in to kick tires in the middle of COVID. If they were coming in, they were coming in because 
retail jewelry stores turned out to be a pretty darn good option for a destination purchase, as opposed to going and ambling through malls or or or, or, or downtowns or whatever else you might want to you might want to look at. So that decline, that multi-decades decline in foot traffic, is, is we're getting back to that, right? So we're now seeing that again. If you've got less foot traffic coming in, and you become, by design or by default, complicit in lowering your average ticket, that is a very, very dangerous combination. So in many respects, for me, the lab-grown versus natural, th that's not the issue. Because again, I, it's out. Technology is out of the box, and, and 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 consumers have said we're happy to buy it. But I think that being by default, because nobody would do it by design, complicit in reducing your own average ticket when you've got fewer people coming into the store, that is a very very dangerous you know place uh, to be. And I and I let would me, be very, very careful about let that. Let me so, summarize it, what you're saying right there is that effectively is that like at Sissy's at our locations, we don't sell lab grown diamond. Effectively because when you take on lab grown diamond where a lot of people don't realize is your sales staff, and I'm not saying your best salesperson, but let's say you have a hundred salespeople and varying experience. The average salesperson is going to try and show what they think is going to sell the fastest in a price range that they're comfortable showing in a price range that they think that customer is going to buy pretty quickly. And that's generally going to trend if you, especially if you carry lab grown to a lot lower average ticket price. So what you're actually saying is it's not so big of an issue of lab grown diamond versus natural diamond. If it's cannibalizing your sales, it's more of the average ticket in the presentation. Is that kind of what you're so yeah, a, a couple of quick qualifiers. Like first of all, my own views on it is there's a place for lab grown. I'm not obviously looking to sell you or anybody who has chosen not to carry lab grown at this point, but there's a place for it. I, I I've been out there enough when I do my 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 sales master classes, and I and I hear about you know the the challenge of getting younger people who are budget conscious to come into jewelry stores. What we I think do not realize is that there is a tremendous threshold resistance with many independent retail jewelry stores. And it's a, it's one of the reasons that young guys in particular will go into the mall because they think that's where I get the best value and they want to spend 3000 bucks or they want to spend 4000 bucks, a massive amount of money to them. I don't think that guy necessarily is going to be happy buying, you know, a third or a half carat natural diamond per se. Now, if somehow that young man comes into the store, any store, and he has that threshold resistance, but he still somehow managed to allow himself, force himself even to go into that store. If what he's facing is a sales professional asking him to spend eight and ten thousand dollars, it reinforces the threshold resistance and it makes it very difficult for him to come back. If, on the other hand, you, you, you have a lab grown option for him and he goes out feeling pretty good about what his situation is, a couple of things happen. Number one, he has now overcome that threshold resistance, and you can now start to think about that customer as a customer for life, right? You, you, all of a sudden, he now feels that he's a Sissy's customer, a Smith Jewelers customer, and so he, he feels like he can be a customer for life. He begins to advocate amongst his own peer group. So I think that there's a lot, of, and, and again, as he you know changes, his world changes, and he starts to make more money and has more discretionary money, he can be a customer where he otherwise would not have been a customer. But getting back to, you know, having it or not having it, if you have it, you have to be cognizant of the average ticket. And what I would say on that is, and I still, uh, I still happen upon retail stores, enough of them uh, uh, who do not have sales goals for their team. I'll never understand it. I just simply will never understand it. But I would say you not only have to have a sales goal for, for your team, but that sales goal absolutely must have average ticket. So whether the salesperson wants to take, as you point out, William, the, 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 the sort of seemingly easy path, right, to, to, to lab-grown sales where they could be selling natural, they will do so in a very transparent way because somebody will be sitting with them at the end of the month and saying, let's look at your sales. And in particular, let's look at your average sale because if you're participating again, 
in a decline of the average ticket in this store, as opposed to if I sell lab grown, you're, you're required to sell the diamond bands with it. You are required to sell the men's bands with it. In other words, have it, or you're required to sell bigger lab grown. In other words, you must be as a sales professional cognizant of that, of that average ticket. And it needs to be transparent and it needs to be measured. Otherwise it becomes not a lab grown problem, but a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability problem. You know, it's not a whole lot different, different product category, certainly, but look at the challenges when, when Alex and Ani became a big thing. Look at the challenges when uh, 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 Pandora became a big thing. In many respects, you were seeing a lot of the same stuff. People were selling lower price point products and creating un big time unintended consequences for the retailer. So I do think you have to measure average ticket and if you're measuring average ticket people will think about things like lab grown in a in a very different way and that's whether you whatever you sell i mean if you take out any category of sales there whether it is or not and you focus on i mean average tickets the biggest identifier in experience of a salesperson uh i would i mean the, the biggest identifier in a salesperson is your average ticket and another yeah. thing too after the price increases that we've had over the last few years if your average ticket is the same as it has been for two years now with all these price increases on product, you're really far behind. That's I mean, right. average ticket should at the very minimum grow by three or four or 5% a year unless your traffic is just going through the roof. And 100%, that's the biggest thing. And I think that brings me into kind of our next point here is that, you know, you teach the sales masterclass. And I love the fact that it's experience-based. It's a lot of uh, a lot of the psychology of sales. Talking about average ticket in that master class, what are some of the things that you work with people on? So the, for, for, at, its, at its core, what the, what the class is about is influencing consumer behavior, in, influencing customer behavior. So I'm not spending time teaching about product. We have a ton of people who teach about product. I'm not spending time talking about theoreticals and, 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 and academia necessarily. What I'm saying is, you know, that the, the purpose of this, you know, think about it this way. You have a baseline of competence across your entire sales team, whether that's a small sales you know, team or a larger sales team. Somebody is always going to be sort of at that lower end of the of the of the performance level if we're measuring performance purely on sales. And I would always put a subtext on that saying profitable sales, right? So if you're the top salesperson because you're discounting the daylights out of product, you may in fact be hurting the business, right? There's a, it, it, so profitable sales, you have a continuum, the best folks and the folks who are the least effective. What I seek to do is to, is to raise everybody's baseline. So we're not, there's no teaching that's going to take a not, you know, a not particularly productive salesperson and make them your top salesperson but it's going to make them a better version of themselves. So I try to deliver to these folks when I do the sales masterclass, actionable steps. So for instance, I'm gonna talk about the uh, paradox of choice, why less is more. And we're not gonna just talk about it in terms of theoretical or academic. We're gonna talk about it in terms of, here's what it looks like. And I want you to put that into practice today. I'm going to talk about the contrast principle. In other words, the relationship between the pricing that you ultimately present to the customer and why that matters such that you can put it into play today. I'm going to talk about you know, pricing psychology. In other words, why how you say price influences customers' behavior and something, again, that you can put into play today. And then if you think about the you know, the, the, the Moravian communication studies from UCLA in the late 60s, which is generally regarded as the best sort of uh, study on, on, on how we communicate. One of the things that came out of that was that we communicate 7% of what we communicate is words. 38% of what we communicate is tone of voice. 55% of what we communicate are, are, is, is, is nonverbals, is physiology. And so I spend a lot of time talking about what does that actually mean in terms of all of the different things you can do uh, to influence consumer behavior. And I try to take that sort of academic study, studies, if you will, 
and turn it into action, actionable, pragmatic steps, and and you know that can be put into place, you know that that very day. So that's that's what it's about. It's about giving people the tools to immediately implement to make them all better than they were the day before I went in. Well, let's circle back and just I mean we originally talked about is our own mindset in downturns and recessions. And then on how our presentations affect that average ticket. I mean, it, that's one of the coolest things that we've learned through all these se the secret shopping and everything else like that is that it is your personality and your own confidence that really goes out there. And I, I don't like to say the word influences, but it highly influences not just what that person buys, but the energy. And th that's one of the things I really enjoyed so much about talking to you is that a lot of people, what we've seen in the industry for decades now is, you know, it went from gemology and product knowledge based and went to really like, hey, this is the item that we're selling. Here's the product details. And now we're coming full circle to where, especially after COVID, hey, this is an experience based business. And what you just said, uh, the small, the things that we think that are smaller are actually the bigger parts of how we present items out of the case, how we look at somebody when we're presenting price and overall, what kind of experience we're actually giving that person. Because I always like to tell this story is that I am from South Arkansas, but the first time they opened Chipotle in Little Rock, I went in and, uh, there was a big line down the front and I walked straight to the front register because nobody was there. And I said, Hey, can I order? And they said, no, the line's back there. So I had to stand behind 50 people, but it's because I didn't understand the business model how to order there. And it's the same thing. What you're talking about is what really focuses on with salespeople and customers is how you give them an experience and how consistent it is. Yeah. I, I think that one, uh, I, I'm sort of annoyed by this too, because I look like I eat every day at Chipotle and you don't, how does that work? But one of the things that um, I have seen throughout the course of my career be a big issue is uh, salespeople selling from their own pocket. And it's a very, very difficult thing to, 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 to banish, right? You can talk to them about it, but I think if you give them tools, you know, and you can talk about why that's not good for the business, why it's not good for the customer. We know from, from all of the psychological studies and data that, that, that's been available to us, that the single best value proposition is a satisfied customer. And we also know through infinite numbers of studies and, and, and what white papers and what have you, that customers actually feel better about a product when they've paid more for it, right? Now that's different than I'm gonna take a crappy product and I'm gonna overprice it. I'm not talking about that, but I'm thinking when you influence and inspire a customer to reach, by, by enabling them to, to, to get there. And again, I go back to paradox of choice and contrast principle. It is incredible where they can go. And I have had, you know, I, I like to think that everybody that I've sort of do the classes or have these conversations with, by the way, it doesn't have to be the, 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 the sales master class. I like to think that they've all learned a little something, but what's incredibly gratifying for me is to have superstar salespeople. And I've got a couple of really, really good examples uh, that sort of keep me sort of going on this. When superstar salespeople say that opened my eyes in a big way. I, for years, have been performing at a very, very high level. I hadn't really thought about that. And once I started to implement that, it changed the whole game for me. It may, I, I got it. It was a light bulb moment. It was a wake up moment. And I've got a couple of superstar people from very high profile retail stores that have been good enough to share that stuff with me. That's when it really, really matters. So I think that it is, it is, you know, we, we, we can't sell from our own pockets. We can't sell as though we ourselves, you know, would have, would have purchased, but having that conversation in some respects can be a bit of an academic uh, uh, exercise unless we give them the tools to overcome that. And I think, you know, that's what I try to do. Give them the tools to overcome their natural resistance to sort of put something for $10,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 in front of a customer when they themselves in their lifetime would never have considered uh, making such a purchase. One of my favorite things to do is I always ask people, I say, okay, <clears throat> is it easier to guess somebody's budget or is it easier to guess over someone's budget? And everybody thinks about it for a second. And they go, okay, I guess it's easier to guess over someone's budget. And I go, okay, if you're guessing someone's budget, what are you doing? You're judging them. You're limiting the inventory that you're going to show. And you can't give a luxury experience. And it really goes into what we try and teach is that the only way to consistently give a luxury experience is to spend the belief of budget. 
And that way you can treat every single person. But the only thing that you really bring into play there is that you might show things that are over people's budget in dealing with that. But everything that I'm hearing from you, it really goes down to culture, enthusiasm, salesmanship, and not just in the product knowledge, but just overall your whole personality and culture of the store. And I, I know you wrote the book, Hiring Squirrels. And this was another question that we've gotten from a lot of different stores is, what are some of the things that you would put in place to create a culture of a store that's a luxury experience, that's fun to work at, and not, is, not just helps hire people, but helps retain people for a long amount of time? Yeah. You know, I feel like that's a two-hour uh, webinar that we would need to, to begin to touch on, the, on, on that stuff. It is, um, and by the way, I want to come back just before I, I answer yeah, that I'm question. I'm sorry, that was a lot there. No, 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 that's not, because the, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in, in, in the budget conversation is believing that the customer has a clue what their budget is. That's 100%. I don't right. believe for one second, in fact, we know this to, to be true, that the, the, the vast majority of people, they might have an idea of something that they would like to spend, but there's no context to that idea. So I think that, um, uh, you know, if you default to a place where you accept they don't really know, it ultimately could be a very a much better experience. But if we think about the sales uh, uh, um, uh, challenges right now, the challenge of hiring salespeople, you know, I, 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 I did a podcast last week and, and the question was asked, you know, what's changed in the in the in, in the nine years or eight, nine years since the book came out? And I said, you know, as, as I begin to look at the central themes of that book, uh, what I would say is the, the the themes are more true, not less true, right? So it's more true today uh, than it is than than it than it is less true. And if you think about some of those themes, um, this idea that uh, because I think that the hiring and retention is two sides of the same coin, right? If you've created the kind of an environment that people would want to or that are drawn to, there's a very very good likelihood that al also contributes to an environment that people would want to stay at you know, once they get there. And so, you know, I think there's different ways to sort of uh, slice that. But number one is, you know, again, if I think about what's not changed, um, that to basically one in four human beings have the capacity to be salespeople. I mean, that hasn't changed. And so if you find a way to throw a net over any number of people, period, not salespeople, not jewelry people, but anybody, go to the mall, go to a ball game, go any place and, and throw a net over them. One in four of those people will have sales wiring. So I, I don't think we do a very good job reaching out and communicating to those people that we do, in fact, uh, are not only are we open, we would be excited about, about meeting some of those folks. That means that we have to tell them what is important to us. And when you talk about what's important to you as a potential uh, hirer, you know, that has to be drive. That has to be sort of or driver, call it self-motivation, call it grit, call it whatever you will. But you cannot teach somebody to be motivated. It doesn't happen. Jim and I had an exchange, I think, on LinkedIn about this uh, and not realizing it would come up today. But there's no scenario where you can motivate somebody to do something they're not inherently motivated to do. Now, you can demotivate people, right? The easiest way is to put a crappy manager over them, and that de demotivates the hell out of people. But you've got to have people who are self-driven. You've got to have people who care about what the customer wants, who, who, who would be willing to understand and work with that customer and read the body language, and read the subtext, and ask the right questions. So in other words, you need empathy. Really important thing. You've got to have people who have empathy. Otherwise, it's the old sort of, I'm a hammer, and everything looks like a nail. And then the one that, for me, it, it just ought to be so obvious and just isn't, and that is, you know, resilience. You cannot be in a job and be successful in a job where you are facing rejection on some level every single day if you don't have good resilience. If you're going to take that personally, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to keep asking the questions you ought to be asking, which is asking for the sale, if you are inviting something that in your brain is akin to being physically accosted, right? So when people with low resilience are rejected, as in, I'll think about that, I'll come back. That's not exactly what I had in mind. 
you know, let me go visit a couple of other stores before I make up my mind. Any version of no to somebody who is who, who lacks, you know, good reserves of resilience feels like a personal rejection. And again, it has that impact on their brain, similar to if they were in a physical fight. So I think we have to do a better job reaching out and, and inviting and embracing folks with those traits. And the only way to do that is structured interviews, not, you know, okay, here's, I had a structured interview. I gave him an hour and it was behind closed doors and it wasn't interrupted. Super. That's not a structured interview. Structured interview is where we're looking for specific things. Now, in terms of the culture, here's what I will say. And it just about fries me. If you, if you're advertising an hourly wage and a week's vacation a year, you don't deserve to have any good people come work for you, right? There has to be a reason why somebody would want to think about coming and working for a business. It's not because you're such a great person or getting a discount on jewelry is in and of itself it, or we're fun to work with, or this is a rock and roll environment. All of those euphemisms don't mean anything. You have to create the kind of an environment. It's a learning environment. It's about potential earnings. So if you've got a salesperson who's making a hundred grand and you're, no matter how long they've been around, no matter how successful that person is, why would you be advertising an hourly wage? You, shouldn't you be saying you have the potential to earn a hundred grand or whatever your top salesperson is earning? Why wouldn't you want to participate with them in some way in either continuing education or just fun learning? If somebody wants to go learn a guitar, would it be a killer to just sort of say, hey, look, we have a policy here inter internally where we're willing to participate because at the end of the day, it's about quality of life, right? It's about quality of life in the space that retail sales professionals spend so much of their time. And, you know, I, I know in this podcast, one of the questions that I was asked was, you know, what do you think the most important question to ask is when you're hiring folks? And I think in many respects, it's the same way as you think about our, our own teams that we manage is, why would somebody want to work here? Right? Why would somebody want to work here? And if you, it's very difficult to be objective about yourself, but if you can take a whiteboard or you can take a piece of paper or you can take a word doc and you can, you can put some interesting and relevant things on that about why somebody would want to come work here, there's probably a pretty good likelihood that you're thoughtful enough about this stuff to be the kind of place that somebody would want to work. If you struggle with that, it's its, its own answer. You know, one of the wildest things since we've launched the Academy was what we've seen a lot is that when we roll this out, like especially with the Academy cell system, it has hours and hours and hours of content on it. And typically when we roll it out to a store, we we let them have all 48 content, all onboarding and fundamentals. And it works in a way where you go one course block a week. So if you look at a store, you know, the amount of time spent training throughout the month should be five, six hours if, if you just went kind of mandated. And you think about it, okay, here's the, most stores roll this out as something that's almost required for sales staff and it goes through that. It doesn't seem like it would be something that people would really latch on. But almost every store that we have within the first month, especially on newer staff, when you click on use, you'll see 20, 25, 30, we even seen up to 37 hours of time spent right. on within the first month. And I didn't understand it at first, but what I really realized is like you're talking about managers is that when you take somebody who's new and you want to give them a purpose to work in jewelry or, you know, you want to make that a great work environment, a lot of training in jewelry stores depends not just on how good that manager is, but the confidence of that sales associate too, to go up there and to maybe they're new to the industry to have to ask these questions. Uh, to maybe they don't know you well enough. Maybe you, you carry yourself in an aggressive manner. And they don't really feel comfortable learning all those things when they need them. And that's the biggest thing that we've taken away from this and learned is that it's not so much that we've helped so much fill this void, but there's a large void where management really has to do a better job of understanding, hey, these people really rely on you. They're wanting to learn here. They're wanting a purpose to go through at work. And, uh, you know, how you carry yourself and how you treat people throughout the day depends everything. One of my favorite quotes is from my dad. He said, you can look in the mirror and that's how the store is going to be that day. Wake up in the morning, look in the mirror. If you're in a good mood, the store is going to be in a that's good right. mood. 
Yeah, well, I agree 100% with him there. Look, I I think to be fair to retail store owners and to managers, they're being asked to do an awful lot, right? And and, and it's almost like they're wearing multiple hats on any given day. And unfortunately, and invariably, one of the things that tends to drop off is training. So training and learning becomes a function of absolute necessity. And once they get a new hire onboarded to the point where they know where the restroom is, they know how how to how to execute this, that, and the other. Then I tend to sort of breathe a sigh of relief and move on. I think one of the things that 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 you're doing, and then I'm doing on a, on a, obviously a whole different level because I'm going into the stores, is you're you're giving them a program that can help them do what they not that they don't necessarily know how to do themselves, and that is pro- provide a, a, a platform for ongoing learning, for a culture of learning. Because if you're, if, you, if you're not implementing a culture of learning, all you're doing is you're checking the necessary boxes. And once those boxes have been checked, you move on and you figure, done. Well, I can tell you, it doesn't work that way. Any, you know, if I work out today and I never work out again, uh, it just doesn't, just doesn't work. Then you end up looking like me. Right. No, don't say it. But I, I'll tell you this. You know, I, I started the academy because uh, I was doing that. I mean, you see this and we get a question a lot is burnout and managing burnout. And that's to the point to where I was when we originally started filming this and doing all this because I was trying to travel between stores and do this. And the best advice I ever got uh, was that a person told me, he said, you can be the most hyper efficient, hardworking person. You might be able to do the job of two or three people, but you can still only be in one place at one time. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's a big thing to learn on working on a jewelry store on a, on a sales team, whether you're in management or you're on the sales floor, as it depends on each other. And, you know, you see a lot of burnout and or I see a lot of burnout on people who try and do everything themselves and kind of have a complex about I want it done this way or this versus people who, you know, I'm sure you even get it because if somebody hires you into their store, they're delegating some of that task and bring somebody else in there. And yeah. In some respects, we do that, though, William, right? Because we we have no compunction about picking the phone up and calling the electrician. And we've got no compunction about sort of calling a plumber if we have some issues there. Yet we are reluctant to do it on one of the most important things in our industry, which is learning, which is implementing a culture of learning. What we're not saying is you, Mr. Manager, or you, Mr. Owner, you're responsible 100% for all of this. What we're saying is, there are resources out there. Use the resources. And one of the things that perhaps we don't talk about enough on the learning side is the mere fact that you're, you care enough about your people to make an investment in their education has benefits beyond just simply what they might learn, whether they're you know, you know, with, with, with the Jewelry Sales Academy or they're with Peter Smith or they're with whomever else they might be using. The benefit is that my, you know, manager cares enough about me to do it. And I think that that that's usually important and very much underlooked. 100%. And then I, I want to cover on this before we close off too, is that delegating tasks in there. I had a big epiphany. I was working in Memphis at one of our locations when we first opened. And I really learned about delegating tasks out because I'd worked in the back office and done all these things. And I had a customer who came in six times a month for five months and ended up, you know, they acted like they could buy the entire store, et cetera. And they ended up wanting to buy like a $20,000 necklace. And it was financed. They come back there. I take out the credit app. I fill it out. I go through all this with them. Turns out the person had terrible credit and couldn't purchase it. And what I really learned in that was that had I worked better with the team or what really happened in that situation is that me as a salesperson working with them, trying to give them a luxury experience, once that came out and I had to go and address them about that, about their credit, that person never came back in the store again. But what I really learned from that is had I delegated that as a salesperson and worked as a team with somebody in the office, I would have never been in that position. That person would have continually shopped with me. And not just in management, but every single thing and delegating out, whether it's time pieces or bridal or especially management. I mean, there's so many different, if you can get people to work better with you, it lowers burnout. It creates a better culture. It does all these different things. Yeah. I'll, I'll share one quick story with them. I might've said it in one of our previous conversations, but I was teaching a master class 
earlier this year. And, you know, what I'll do is I'll give a couple of hours after that to be used whatever way the, the store wants to use them. And so different people use use different things. Could be one-on-one -on -one coaching with salespeople, or it could be taking the managers offsite to talk about hiring or sitting with the owner. But I had this, you know, one owner who said, look, will you work with my manager? I'm, I'm struggling to sort of get him to manage. It's a very, very good salesperson, but I'm struggling to get him to manage. And uh, it turned out in the course of the conversation, um, he was a huge basketball fan and, and, uh, and a huge, you know, Boston Celtics basketball fan, as it happens. And I asked him, he was uh, certainly old enough to remember, um, do you remember when Michael Jordan came and played for the Bulls against the Celtics in the playoffs early in his career and Jordan put 63 on the Celtics? in the old Boston Garden. And he said, well, of course I remember that. And I said, do you remember who won? And he said, the Celtics won. And I said, that's exactly right. That's an interesting metaphor to, un to un and, and when Jordan stuck, when, so when Jordan scored 63 and you know he got all the accolades and, and people were writing about it, but the Bulls lost the game. When Jordan started to make the people around him better, the Bulls won six out of eight championships, right? And he was gone from, all or most of the two years in between. So in other words, when he as a manager, if we use that, uh, that metaphor, began to sort of make everybody better and raise all of the bars, they were better off for doing it. Now that doesn't mean this guy ought to have been a manager. At some point, I think he'll have to make the decision. Am I so great as a salesperson that I don't really want to be a manager? But if you want to be a manager, and this is one of the things that differs from business to business, one of the things I'll ask is, What's your definition of a manager? Is it really just you want a top salesperson with keys and schedule responsibilities? Or do you actually want them to be the Jordan that makes everybody around them, him better? Or would you rather have that guy who scores 63 and then, you know, wherever everything else lands is where it lands. So I think that was an interesting metaphor for me to sort of think about that uh, in, the, in the management side, but you do have the ongoing responsibility to make sure that you're a mentor, that you're a counselor, that you're a shoulder to cry on, that you'll kick a rear end every once in a while when it needs to be done, that you're crystal clear in your communication about what's expected. Crystal clear in your communication about what's you know what's expected and 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 make sure that you're 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 willing to give the credit where credit is due every once in a while you know i i, I worked in retail for many many years I, I i worked in when i first moved over to this country i worked at whitehall jewelers and then i went to work for tiffany i never had a problem when i went into management spending a, you know time with a customer making a sale and ensuring that i had a salesperson involved in that in other words, I wanted to build up their confidence. I wanted to help them where I could help them make more money. And I, you know, and so I would, so they saw me then as a, as, as a, a mentor and somebody that was really supporting, uh, supporting their career. And I think that that's something we've got to be thinking about in the stores. How do we make all of our people better? Well, man, I think that's great. And then Peter, if somebody does want to help make their people better or reach out to you or anything like that, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so the probably the best way is is email, and that's the retail smiths at gmail.com. The retail smiths at gmail.com. Um, I'm also active on LinkedIn. They can always contact me through LinkedIn. And then if they're a client of yours through the Jewelry Sales Academy, you know, you have my permission to give them my cell. I would rather not put that out for everybody, but if they call you and want it, by all means, uh, feel free to share that. All right. So we'll get on there. Anybody who's a member of the Academy, you can email in. We'll give you direct contact information or contact information for Peter. And Peter, I've really enjoyed this and I hope we can do this again in the future. And so I know we're running late on time. It's uh, 9.55. And so a lot of stores are about to open if they're not already. So thank you for joining us on our first uh kind of webinar month of Across the Case and inaugural guest, Peter Smith. I really enjoyed it. And we'll also, you'll be at in-store speaking. Yes. We're the Academy will be at in-store. We have a speaking panel also there on Monday. So if you're going to in-store in Chicago, make sure you stop by, see Peter, see us, and hope you all uh, have a great day and sell lots of jewelry. So we're going Thanks to so much for the invite. Thank you.